an important way that it handles metadata. So do you, you shoot any script-based features or drama or anything like that? I guess it's probably the wrong sort of crowd there. But what I'll show you is that script-based information, even if you didn't have any at the outset when you were shooting, is massively valuable. Imagine, if you will, that you're searching online, go to Google and you look for Jeremy Clarkson. If you're that way inclined, uh, you might find his Sunday Times column. Um, if you go to YouTube and start searching for him, you're relying on people having inserted meta tags in the video so that that content reveals itself in a search. There's no way that you can actually search the content of the video. So what we've introduced into the Premiere tool in the middle there is a script analysis engine, which essentially turns all of the dialogue into text and then embeds that in the metadata of the video. Provided you expose that to your search capability in the right way, you've essentially just Googleized your video content. So really, the reason we have this story tool at the front is to allow collaborative working in the cloud and also to produce what's a living document. Conventionally, um, script-based drama gets shot, the script ends up being scribbled all over, and by the time you come to produce the DVD or whatever else, it bears almost no relationship in terms of the yeah, living improvisation and scene changes to that original document. You know, it's still the case in many drama workflows, they still murdering trees and printing reams and reams of scripts and different editions and different revisions. The story kind of gets around that because it becomes an organic document that lives with the project and you can keep it up to date. Marry it with the video footage all the way through. In the advent of shooting things digitally, we've got the convenience of being able to pick up any kind of camera device and point it and shoot it straight away. And generating digital media, and, you know, you, can, you never miss an opportunity to get a shot. With that comes the, the complication of housekeeping. Suddenly you've got thousands and thousands of media files that are all called DCIM342.abi. You know, how are you supposed to keep track of all that stuff? So we introduced a product called Prelude, which is a logging uh, and shot listing and metadata editing tool that manages reams and reams, you know, gigs, even terabytes of digital video media and allows you to start working with it start shop listing, start building, we'll come to that in a bit, but to a great thumbnail system where you can just hover scrub over the clips and you can see exactly, you can, you can start doing 10 clips at a time and just wave around all over them and see exactly what you need. Premiere is really the centerpiece of the, um, of the solution, that's our video on linear editing tool. So that um, has something in it called the Mercury Playback Engine, which we introduced in CS5. That's the special source that sets us apart from competition in that you can actually source digital media from any number of sources and mix it all together on a single timeline without ever transcoding, wrapping, or modifying that video in any way. You can natively mix ARRI raw cinema footage with iPhone video. You can happily play the two back together side by side. This is completely multi-threaded, 64-bit. Harness every last ounce of uh, performance out of your computer to be able to play that stuff back in real time. Audition, AU, is our sound sweetening tool, which is great for removing noises, clicks, pops. You know, if you shot audio in a noisy environment, it'll go some way to actually, you know, mitigating that, fixing that kind of stuff. It's a great sort of forensic type tool for audio sweetening. After Effects, um, some say the dark arts. That's our motion graphics and visual um, effects tool. So any kind of 2D or 3D motion graphics or effects you want to generate as in isolation for the web or to be superimposed on top of video. We've got a 3D camera tracker in there now, so you can do some really exciting stuff where you can track the motion of the video shot and pin a three-dimensional text object to the video so it looks like it actually was part of it all along. It's quite exciting. That goes hand in hand with Premiere, so that any projects you work on in one are visible in the other. It's simply just an alt-tab, drag, drop kind of setup. There's no import, export, there's no save as. Two are tied together by what we call dynamic link, which means they share the same RAM, which means anything you're doing with your video editing piece, the graphics on the other side can be just laid up on top of one another. Speed grade is, uh, is the last piece in the, in the media production space. So that's uh, from a company we acquired late last year called Iridas. So that is or was a $40,000 color grading solution when you bought it in isolation. Now just part of the creative suite, just another application that adds value to what you might do. So that's um, a very, very high quality 32-bit floating point color tool that will obviously it's all what you're always at the mercy of what you shot and you know the quality of the lens and the quality of the image sensor. But that really has some magic in there that can allow you to retrieve and rescue 
data and, and, and um, fidelity from shadow areas of the pictures that you just never knew it was there. It's just it's so high quality in terms of its color fidelity. And again, that works with uh, high-end cinema formats, um, quick time and image sequences, DPX, that kind of stuff, and then you to deal with that. At the out stage, we have Encore, which is our Blu-ray and DVD authoring tool. And um, that actually creates um, something called a web DVD as well, which I'll show you, which is pretty much the most underutilized tool in the suite. Every, people see it and go, wow, that's amazing. And then they forget all about it and they never use it again. It creates a completely self-contained flash-based website with video subtitles and the interactivity of a Blu-ray all inside a directory that you can upload to an HTTP server and it's instantly available on the web. So for distribution purposes, it's absolutely the perfect way to distribute a video piece if you want a level of interactivity and searchability and chapters and all that kind of stuff in there. The one application that doesn't have a two-character mnemonic on it, that kind of funny screen slope thing there, I've never really figured out what it's supposed to be, but that's Adobe Media Encoder. That will spit out your video in any flavor or any format you might need. So that will deliver platform-based Android or iPad video, it will deliver pre-packaged video for Vimeo, for YouTube, it can write back to transmission servers. So where Premiere Pro is used in a professional uh, enterprise type environment for television transmission, it can actually send the final package out to a transmission server. It can preload stuff into an automated playlist. We talk to all manner of playout servers and transmission automation systems. We're really part of any kind of ecosystem where video is created. Obviously, as well as I mentioned, you can create Blu-ray and DVD compliant output as well. This is a bit more about Mercury playback engine. So um, for the techie people amongst you, um, as I mentioned, Premiere is a fully 64-bit multi-threaded application. And we do have the best dual platform performance, dual platform performance in the market. We can outperform other editors out there um, by often many streams. You can, as I say, load video from any kind of format, have it playing back simultaneously. The cherry on that particular cake is the fact that we have um, graphics-based acceleration as well for NVIDIA graphics cards and newly for the um, ATI graphics that's in the newer Mac, uh, um, the previous generation of Mac laptops, MacBooks. Which means that all of your visual effects that you might put on, whether it's a color correction, or a key, or a warp, or a blur, or any of that kind of visual effects stuff you might put on, all gets loaded onto the graphics system. Even in the case of my laptop here, it gets loaded onto the graphics card, and actually all that acceleration takes place on there, so it doesn't slow down. So even though you might have several streams of HD video playing back, you can have all of those video layers playing back simultaneously with visual effects, without ever needing to render it. So add that to the fact that I mentioned on the way in, you don't have to render or transcode video to be able to play it back. It plays anything in its native form. Many other systems, people tend to think it's normal to sit there watching a progress bar for several hours, converting video before they can even actually start editing it. It's, it should be the case, as it is with us. It's just loaded up and play back again. Some of these enhancements found their way to After Effects in the latest release as well. Uh, any of you ever used After Effects before? Okay, so real, ah, oops, saw the hand over there. A real virgin crowd, almost. So After Effects is heavily RAM-based, and that's kind of by design, that's how it's been for 20 years. So you can do very, very intricate um, keyframe-based movements, visual graphics, 3D and stuff, but as soon as you change one keyframe, it's gotta go back and work it all out again, load it all into RAM. So After Effects operators are used to spending most of their time rebuffering and re-RAM previewing things. We've invented something called the Global Performance Cache, which means that every frame that's ever been seen by After Effects, it memorizes, makes an index of, and parks in the disk cache. So first of all, if you change one thing, it's only gonna re-render that part of the timeline that changed. And secondly, if you reintroduce a piece of footage six months down the line, even if you never saved the project, After Effects knows it's seen it before, it pulls it back from the disk cache. That's your perfect excuse to go out and buy those SSD disks that you've been busting after and put a really expensive workspace to get a lot of cores, expensive graphics card and lots of RAM. Also, um, we harness the power of NVIDIA's optics, which again is related to the CUDA GPU stuff on the other side. That's what gives us this 3D extrusion and 3D ray tracing. After Effects has never really been a 3D tool, even though we say it is. It's 2.5D, it or it always was. You take a 2D object and you manipulate it in 3D space, it still has no depth. It's still kind of a flat plane that we're turning around in three axes. That all completely changed in CS6 because we introduced this 3D ray tracing engine. You can now take any flat object, could be a bit of text, could be a solid, could even be an illustrator document. So you could have multiple parts in there, so it could be a company logo, 
after effects will fully extrude it and create depth to it. You can also have light shining off it. You can also have uh, you know environment layers as we call them, which is a bit difficult to get your head around. It's an imaginary invisible sphere painted on the inside that reflects off an object to give it texture around it. You'll see it. <laughs> we'll get it. Anyway, that's quite enough wittering. Let me show you some of the toys. So first and foremost, this is incredible. So this is the tool that we introduced specifically for managing and handling large amounts of digital video data that you might have shot in the field. This is the biggest problem. You end up with thousands and thousands of clips. The camera operator hasn't entered any kind of comments or remarks in the field, and you're stuck having to log maybe 20, 30, or hundreds of hours of footage. So first and foremost, it gives you a thumbnail of each bit of video. So it doesn't matter what format it is. Again, it's DL DSLR stuff, so it's .mov. As you can see, as I scrub across my cursor, the point I reach as a percentage of the distance across the width of the clear shows you the beginning, middle, and end of what's going on in the activity there. So straight away, I can begin to scan across multiple clips, find out what sort of piece of video I'm interested in, and start to look at it. Then if I select a particular clip and decide I'm going to focus on that, it gives you an audio scrub as well. You can see I've shot so this is some stuff we worked on with Mattel. They basically tried to emulate a lot of their Hot Wheels toys with real cars. So they do scary stuff. It's quite a bit of fun. So before this car comes down the ramp, there's a fair bit of kind of preamble there where nothing's happening. So if I decide, you know, at the outset when I'm logging my footage, I want to discard that even before it reaches the end. I can mark an in there and say, right, let's go across. And as soon as he kind of is in the distance, you know, I'm going to cut away there, that bit of the shot's not useful to me, I can mark it out. It will only copy across, or it will only ingest the bit of the clip that's yellow. So immediately, I've cut down by 50% the amount of data I've got to copy off the current car, because I've just decided I want to copy that piece off. So I can go through and do that with multiple clips. I can then choose transfer clips to destination. That doesn't make any sense in this case, because I'm working with footage that's already on my hard drive, I'm not going to copy it again. This is if you were put pointing to a camera card that you pulled out and mounted on the system. This tool also allows you to make multiple simultaneous copies. This is quite important when, you, um, when you're on a professional location shoot. It's quite often a requirement of insurance that they insist you leave the set with three copies of the media that will go off to different places. So if you lose you know, digital data, right? You know, there's, there are no tapes, there is no film in a can anymore. You've got to have copies of this data on hard disks. Pelly will allow you to do that, will allow you to add multiple, and I don't think there is a number of limits, a limit to the number of destinations, simultaneous copies of that media. So one could be your local disk, one could be an external USB, one could be a network drive, and one could be a deep tape auto loader archive or something like that, so you're absolutely sure that your media is safe and copied. Um, I can also do a transcode on the fly, you see. So if, as I mentioned, we've shot really super high res 5K footage shot in red, Epic or the Scarlet or one of the really high-end modern movie cameras, you're going to end up with files that are you know, 20, 30 gigabytes each. Not particularly practical if you want to work with them on the fly, you know, using a laptop. So we allow you to make one of the copies to be a very low-resolution transcode. So you can say, just make me a one megabit H.264 copy on the way in. So that's like almost a proxy or you know, like a, a draft version of it that you're going to work with. And then later on in the, in the piece, you can relink to the high-resolution video when you've reached a point where your editorial is actually taking shape. So it's, it's a sort of offline, online type workflow. So anyway, I'm not going to copy those clips of us just now. I'm just going to import a couple up here. And I'm going to bring them into the next stage. What it does is basically is making me a shopping list of video. So these clips up here are the ones I brought in. And when I double click on one, what you get is a very sort of tactile interface. So the interface is all about the video. You've got nice big thumbnails, your audio waveforms down there. For some reason they're not coming up at the moment. Um, all of my transport based controls are keyboard driven. So if I want to mark a subclip over here in the metadata, I hit one. I'm going to call that something adventurous like subclip one. And as I go through, I can then mark an out. What, you, what that does is actually right to metadata into the video clip and starts topping and tailing and starts producing the portions of a shot that we can later go and build up. Now this is actually, as soon as I hit save, this is going to be hard written into the metadata of the clip. So whilst I'm going to take this off to Premiere in our video editor, 
I hesitate to add, you could take it off to any other video editing package as well, because it's just adding, it's just adding XMP metadata into the video. So the next stage would be, after I've marked, I've marked a subclip in there, mark a comment in as well. So this, I might say, this is the take I like best. metadata is being embedded at this early stage where we're monitoring video. Um, and that will persist throughout the workflow. This is, where we, this is where this kind of metadata thread passes through the piece that we looked at that slide, goes all the way from story to media and coder playout. Your metadata persists all the way through. And that includes speech transcriptions as well. So this is something I touched on with the Google example. We're not going to do any speech transcription here. I'll show you an example of that later on. But it's just a type of metadata that can exist inside your video. Making video searchable and usable is all about the data you put in, right? It's a, it's a cliche, but you only get out what you put in. So this is the tool where you're going to create all that kind of stuff. So next I'm going to create a basic rough cut. And this is where we start to assemble shots together. So let's just load up that first go shot, throw that in there. And I've got two shot here with two of them together. And that keeps all the comment based metadata as well. It's not a particularly marvelous edit. Single a in there as well. So all you can do at this stage is load and reorder video clips. You can't add any transitions or wipes between them. You can't do any trimming to make shots longer or shorter. That's you know we're getting into a territory where there's a certain amount of overlap between what you do in a long tool and what you do in an editing tool. And by design, we've decided to limit things to being a very very basic, straightforward interface. Because this is the sort of thing where you might, in a big production, have a hundred people using Prelude, working through logging video footage feeding three or four craft editors who are actually piecing the show together in the middle of the But the fact that the two are utterly compatible with each other is the key. So if I take this over to Premiere, send to Premiere Pro, you'll see this exact same layout of shots come up in Premiere. There it is. And there we go. And it's carried all that metadata across. A good take. Edit. That's why I've got a good one here. Well, to break the world record today, the other driver has to jump over 300 feet. To put that in perspective, it's like dropping off a 10 story building and then launching the length of a football field through both sets of goalposts. We'll be using the same vehicle, but as we've seen, a lot can go wrong. So there you go. That's just a basic editorial put together from footage shot on a 5D of a track day with the Mattel guys. So that's only a single camera format. What I'm going to do now is return to what I talked about, about mixed formats. So, to illustrate that we really can handle any type of video media, I shot some stuff on my phone earlier on the way in. And you can tell it's phone-based video. It's good and shaky. But, you know, it's, it's full HD video. Most cameras do shoot full HD now. But the problem, what gives this away is the fact that I didn't have a tripod. You know, it's not, it's not the image quality, it's not the, the color fidelity, that, that could probably be passed off. It's just the fact that it's pretty much impossible to hold a, hold a phone still if you have it. So that's why we introduced a tool in Premiere. It was first in After Effects and then we added it in Premiere. It's called the Warp Stabilizer. And what this does is a dynamic combination of cropping the shot automatically rescaling it and then doing some kind of special source that we call this subspace warp. You end up with something that looks a bit more like this. So this is pre this is pre-analyzed in that it, it looks at each frame and it find out finds out what image data is common to all of the adjacent frames and makes a decision about where it's going to move things. But the actual um, compensation for that is happening as a live visual effect on my graphics card as I mentioned earlier. So I'm not using any additional um, computer resources to add this warp stabilizer on there than I would be just to play the clip back in the first place. So now it looks a bit more like that. And as you can see, that looks much more, you can almost believe that that was on a tripod and you just track the shot across like that. 
and towards the end it does it levels out you know it's about as still as I could possibly hold it but that's that's pretty much usable now if I turn the effect on and off you know you begin to see how much image you've lost around the edge but that's kind of a small sacrifice and small price to pay for having a much more stable usable image so camera footage now semi-professionally delivered ready to be you know put out wherever so I mentioned that we're capable of working with a number of different formats. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get some red footage. Now, red's probably not something that many of you have been exposed to, but the guy who owned the Oakley sunglasses company woke up one day and said, you know, the film world is, is the last place that just hasn't been digitally revolutionized. People are still shooting 35 mil. They only really stopped in probably the last two years. In fact, you, you still can. Nobody buys film cameras anymore, really, but you can still hire them. You can still buy film stock. It's just quite a massively expensive way to work now with 35 mil features. But, you know, it's, we, we're in the very dying ends of it, but companies like Ari and companies like Red, which was started by the Open guy, he just decided it was going to revolutionize that particular industry. He knew nothing about it. He just quite liked films. Hired a few people who knew how to build it with image sensors. And essentially, they've built now their, their um, flagship is a thing called the Scarlet, and it shoots 5K images. And by that, I mean it's 5,000 pixels along the top, 4,000 pixels deep. So it's something like 12 to 15 times higher resolution than HD. And it shoots 24 full frames a second. And that generates such an enormous amount of data, it has to use some kind of compression scheme. But rather than using JPEG or any of the conventional formats that are fairly lossy and you end up being able to see them, uses a very sophisticated um, wavelet format. What's good about that is it allows you, it, it basically, the way the file is, without being too technical, the way the file is constructed internally, it allows you to play the file back at full res, half res, quarter res, eighth, sixteenth, easily, without having to recalculate that data. It's just, just the sixteenth size version and the eighth size version, they're all in the file, they're all readable. It's called debayering. It's quite complex mathematics. But it means that I can take a 5K file, and here is one. It's at a native 2 to 1 uh, pixel aspect ratio, so the image itself is, is twice as wide as it is deep. Uh, so that's a fairly cinematic type ratio. But this here, I've got it set to a portrait. If I go to full and try and play it back, my laptop's probably going to explode. Yeah, it's not happy. As you can see, it's absolutely nailing. It's a, this is an 8-core i7 laptop. It's not too bad. But it just can't even begin to cope with playing that image because it's a 5K image, 24 frames a second. But because RED is designed in such a way that I can easily drop down and go to half, go to quarter, you're never, ever going to see the difference on a quarter screen image of a desktop and a projector that small. You know, that, that even one-eighth of that resolution is going to be perfectly adequate for editing purposes. But it allows me to switch down to an eighth and then what I get is complete full screen playback. So nobody's moving at the moment, but uh, there you go, float running away. But I get that same level of tactile scrub, shuttle, control, and playback on this image, just as if it was a quick time or something shot on a Canon 5D or even a television digital camera. I can take this clip and I can mix it in with this sequence that I've made over here. So I've got my 1080p phone video here. If I drag this over, put that on as another track, first thing you're going to see turn that on, is what am I looking at here? What you're actually looking at is a 1920 by 1080 shaped window carved out of the middle of that 5K file, because it doesn't really know what you want to do. That image is so much bigger than everything else you're working with, how's it supposed to interpret it? So by default, it assumes you're going to want to keep that full resolution, and then what I could do is go in and use my motion-based um, effects plugin. So if I just... Uh, Under motion, I have the ability to scale that up and down, see, until it fits. So this is the important part about Premiere. Not only is it not necessary to convert, do anything with video footage on the way in to use it, it's not making any assumptions about what I might want to do with that video. I can pan and scan inside it, I can crop it, I can expand it, I can do what I like, and I'm not committed to any of those decisions, even when I get ready to make the export. This timeline that we're working on here is notionally a high-definition 1080p timeline. But when I come to make my export, 
I can still make a YouTube version, I can make a full quality 4K cinema version. It's never discarded any of the information because it's dealing with all this media in its raw format all the way through. So the most sensible decision would be to right click on it and there's an automated feature in here where I go scale to frame size. So there we go. And if I reset now the motion uh, aspect there, basically it's just going to do the best fit that it can. I'm going to scale it down slightly there just to come through the point. Put it off there in the corner there. But essentially now as a test, what we've got here, this green dot is going to tell me how many frames I've dropped while I'm playing back. Now bear in mind, I've got a single stream of video, but I've got a live warp stabilizer going on it. And to that, I'm adding a 5K video file, and I'm playing it all back out at native 1080. Let's play across there. And as it hits that, you'll see, it's still playing back in real time. Even though it's completely resizing and rescaling two different native formats at the same time. Oh, I did drop some frames at the end there, alright. <laughs> that means, okay, check it out, you might add a couple of frames here and there. So, let's make it interesting, however. If I go to my folder, do this Pro H to green screen, and like that, there we are. This is now a 720p video file, but it's one that was shot on a professional broadcast camera, it was shot on Panasonic P2. This is in the DVC Pro HD codec, for those who are interested. It's fairly fairly arcane now, but this was one of the standards for high def from about four or five years ago. One of the earlier file-based high definition formats that was introduced to the field. So I can drag that on as another layer, and this time you see it's actually smaller than my uh, master sequence, because it's a 720p and it's been dropped into a 1080 sequence. So what I'm going to do here, this has been shot against a green screen. I want to remove him from that green screen background and do that with a process called uh, chroma key. But the problem with this particular green screen is it's the, the worst lit shot just about in history. There's about 17 shades of green in there, even on this projector you can see that. That's not the idea. The point is it's supposed to be uniformly lit, so the Kia can pick up on one shade of green and remove the guy from it. Also, the shot wasn't actually even framed correctly, so this green tarpaulin at the back doesn't fill the screen. So there's no way it's going to be able to key out near this extraneous noise that's on the outside there, so that's another problem. If I go in and grab my Ultra Key plugin, I'm going to drop that on there. Let me just solo up that video track so we see it in isolation. So, look at some of my effects parameters here. The way the Kia works is you get your little pipette dropper here, <coughs> and you go and select a portion of the green. There we go. As you can see, it's made a fist of it, but it's, there's still a lot of problems here. There's a lot of that um, drape showing in the background. If I flick over to what we call the alpha channel output, where it just shows me the mat, I can really see the damage caused. Yeah, this is, this is nothing like an accurate key. But luckily, this ultra key plugin, which is a standard part of Premiere, has what we call an aggressive setting. So I do that, and it simply just cleans up that mat. It figures out, you know, on a sliding scale between zero for black and one for white, it figures out that most of that shadowy noise wasn't supposed to be there. There's a tiny little vestige of it left down there, but I can go in there and I can use the matte cleanup to get rid of some of that stuff. You see and go to contrast and pull that out, and that's now more or less gone. So this kind of fixed the problem. The problem of the shot not having been framed properly that I talked about earlier, if I pick up a four-point or a four-point garbage mat, you can fix that problem by going in there and actually just cropping the image. If I crop slightly white, so as not to lose anything, get rid of the vestiges of that white, uh, the area behind the curtain. There we go, I've got a fairly solid key now. So I flip back to my composite output and turn on the other tracks here. Now we've got our guy, chroma keyed over the top. So if I shrink him down a bit and just put him in the bottom right hand corner. And this is exactly how the um, sign language accessibility workflows are done for television shows, exactly with the guy on the green screen keyed just like this. And now I go and play back. Ten eighty P camera footage, five K cinematic footage, seven twenty P broadcast footage with a live ultra key. And now that I've switched down to half resolution, I'm not dropping any frames. So this is what the Mercury playback engine is all about. And just using a laptop, but you're working with an editing system that will quite happily handle video from any source. And you've got not got to make any decisions or commitments about how you use that video until you're ready to hit the red button and say print this out. So, 
the other thing I can add as well is stills. I can make stills behave kind of as if they are um, video files in themselves. So I also shot some stills on my phone as well earlier to find the directory. There we are. Load one of them. There we go. It's just a still image of the hall. Again, if I drag that in, I've got a 1920 by 1080p sized window within this much larger still. So I can go adjust to frame size, scale to frame size. But in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what's called um, a keyframe animation. So this video still image on track five now is, um, if you like, a video entity in and of itself. So if I go to motion, select the beginning of the image, and say, right, position, let's wind the scale down, so it's going to fit the right hand corner. The position, start off the screen. By the time you reach the middle of the shot, placeholder that uh, shines through to the layers below and um, it, it is kind of a master for, uh, for working on what's underneath. So if I get that adjustment layer, load that on there instead of the title. I'm now I'm going to go to that adjustment layer and say actually create me an After Effects composition. Do you remember I mentioned the two applications talk to each other so they share the same space of RAM. Anything I create in After Effects is going to be superimposed on top of what I create inside Premiere. So, let me get the text tool in here. Let's load that up. Let's go across media. Because After Effects is a, a, a visual effects and motion graphics tool, it's got much more interesting ways of manipulating any kind of text or graphics object in the site. So if I go to browse presets, it opens up a ton of different cool effects and things you can do with text inside Bridge. And many of you work with Bridge. It's quite a cool sort of li library management Swiss Army knife conversion tool. So in here, I've got some text effects, uh, and if I go animate in, I've got some different ways that I can actually make that text appear on the screen. So if I choose, uh, I highlight the text layer, and I choose range of characters, double click on that. frames show me when my motion is going to stop. But essentially I get something like this. It's just a more interesting thing to do with text than just a very bog standard caption. The cool thing is now because of Dynamic Link, back in Premiere, exactly that effect on the text is going to exist inside this little placeholder because it's playing back what's inside After Effects. There you go, you see? Just a much more interesting thing to do with text. While we're on the topic of text, let's shift it up another gear. So I mentioned to you, this is our uh, more from our Mattel shoot. This is quite a fun little vehicle called the Bone Shaker. Quite 
quite an interesting body kit on there. And as you see, as the camera tracks up over those air intakes there, you've got all sorts of motion in the image. Lateral, horizontal, vertical, nothing is still. So rather than try and stabilize that image as I did earlier on, let's try this the other way. Let's try and get something to follow that movement. If I right click on that clip, again, replace with After Effects Cop, it's going to take that video shot, open it in After Effects, load it up, and now I can do what's called track camera. So it's a very similar process to that which we had uh, earlier on where it's tracking the image. It's doing the same sort of analysis on the frame, finding out what's moved and where it's gone. But in this case, it's not going to stabilize anything. It's just going to create some nice little sparkly X multicolored points all over the image that follow transient edges um, very tightly that you can then pin something to. Completely automated. So we were always able to do tracking in After Effects, but you used to have to pre-select points in the image and decide to follow that. Now it follows anything it thinks is interesting as it moves along. See? So all these little X markers are there for you to pin something to. So I go back into the project and open up uh, 3D Tracking to begin. Uh, there's the 3D text version. Here is a version where I've just taken a text caption exactly as I did in Premiere, but now I've pinned it to what we call the 3D camera tracker, and we end up with this. Let's give it a second to buffer, there you go. It's a 2D text object pinned perfectly into the motion of that video. But I'm not done yet, because I mentioned that we now have a full ray traced extruded 3D engine. It's absolutely true. So, here is what you, you've got two kind of vantage points here to show you that that's only a two dimensional object. Fairly obvious there. But from this kind of off to the side 3D view there, you can see there's no depth to these characters whatsoever. We're now able to create fully extruded text. There it is. So that's exactly the same thing with real 3D text objects with proper depth, with uh, ambient light reflecting off them. But it's still a fairly boring, gray, silvery gray color. So I can do something more interesting. I mentioned earlier that we have this concept of something called environment. So if I load up this version of it, you can start to see the system having to think a little bit more about what it's doing frame to frame now. And this is really where you need a multi-core system with decent uh, video graphics. This laptop has got a Quadro 5000 card in it. It's the only reason I have to carry such an enormous lump around with me to do these kind of demos. It's about the biggest, ugliest, most powerful laptop in the universe. But there you go. So that's playing through. Now it's not that obvious, but I've created an environment layer that is shining off that. So if I just show that layer in isolation, and I go to Pearson Reflections on, it's just a really subtle yellow blue grad. So that's why you can't really tell it's there. So just to emphasize, I'm going to choose a really horrible, disgusting, gaudy, day glow type colour scheme. Let's load that up. There we go. That we should be able to see reflected around the text. Let's turn these back on. There we go. So now and again, because of the global performance cache, anything in terms of the video file, the movement of those anchor points, and the actual creation of the text layer is already pre-rendered. It's only going to re-render what I changed in that column on the outside. Just give it a few seconds. And as you see that green line grow, that green line is building frames into RAM. But having made this change, it's going to save all of those frames to the disk. So that if I ever decide to pick this strange color scheme again a few months down the line, it will find a version of that that was pre-rendered and will load it up much quicker than you're seeing it. Just give it a second, it's really thinking now. I'll just up the off and then you get effectively oh. I'm upset it now. <laughs> but you get the idea, there you go. Much more obvious what's happening with those 3D text objects. I've got this kind of artificial colour scheme on the inside of invisible sphere reflecting around them. So I've only got five minutes left, um, so back in Premiere, uh, let's just have a quick look at the speech analysis stuff I talked about because it's quite interesting to see. Uh, if I go and look for my jellyfish clips, I might load up uh, the raw transcript version and go to Windows metadata. So this 
is something that was shot without a script. It's an interview. <coughs> but it's got a fairly audible, clear dialogue track. Jellyfish and Jellyfish Lake are really quite interesting biologically. They're actually derived from a more common lagoon-dwelling species that since the... So what I can do there is right-click and go Analyze Content. Now if I have an attached script file, if it's shot to a script, it uses that as a guide, as like a dictionary, to try and understand these words. I don't have one, so what I end up with is something like this. Well, the uh, golden jellyfish and jellyfish lake are really quite interesting biologically. They're actually derived from a... So it's about 70% accurate. Probably good enough to start searching through it, but it's not perfect. If I then do a proper transcription of the audio, marry that up to the video and analyze it again, I end up with something like this. So first of all, it's got his name there. So now if I search through my deep archival library of video clips for Dr. Pat Collin, it's there in the metadata screen. It's going to find every clip was ever shot with him in it. Equally, if I search for the word jellyfish, it saves me watching a five minute interview. I can just whistle through and find out everywhere he said that word. It's just four times. Click on it and it will play for just before there. Very quiet, sorry. That since the last glaciation, that's now perfect. Sea level has the back up from about, uh, and so that's something that's completely embedded in that video object, and it will also be embedded in your final output file as well. It's so important, regardless of what you do with this video, any time in the future, whether it gets broadcast, whether it goes on the web, it's got this really rich vein of searching metadata. The last bit of the piece, um, what we're whistling through now, is exporting my final sequence. So find the sequence, there it is. I've got various options if I go file, export, media. If I go and send that in queue, it's going to send it to media encoder. If I hit export, it's going to lock up the interface. So the, the difference there is if you want to carry on editing, you would send this to a background as a background job to media encoder, which is running down here. Now as I mentioned, all of the presets have been set up really, really in a straightforward way so they're understandable. Broadcast video output formats writing back to the camera, platform devices, Android, Apple, Zoom, if any people still have those, mobile, tablets, TiVo, DVD and Blu-ray, whatever I want. So if I take that sequence, drag it over to here, do you remember it's got all manner of different kind of mixed formats and all sorts of stuff that I've added together in there. Now is the only time that I'm actually making a decision how I want this video to be delivered. So I'll drag this in over here, it's going to add that sequence, Give it a sec. It's thinking. Now I can highlight that and I can say, well, okay, you're going to make me a, a 1080 interlaced 25 version for HDTV broadcast, that's fine. I'd also like a Blu ray version, please. Double click on there. I'd also like some web video. And I'm going to send it to. Um, I'm also going to send it to Vimeo. Click, there we go. Now I hit go, and it just goes and spits out all three formats in tandem automatically. Completely 64-bit, completely multi-threaded. You know, this is the sort of thing that you might farm out to a very high-end workstation or a server, because you're going to really want to crunch numbers and build these video output files. But it all can be done from within the suite. So regardless of where you need this video to go, what you're going to deploy it for, you can create that output format. So the message is to take away doesn't matter where it came from, doesn't matter where it's going, and you should never have to do anything to it in the middle other than play and work with it. So, I mentioned we can deliver to any variety of flat output formats for web and broadcast, etc. I can make Blu-rays, I can make DVDs. This is my DVD and Blu-ray creation suite here. Again, this ties in with Premiere in a very similar way to how Premiere worked with After Effects. So if I go back to my Premiere sequence here and I add a bunch of chat points, See, those are going to translate to DVD chapter points once they appear, or Blu-ray chapter points once it appears in Encore. So I drag that over there, create a new timeline from it. There we go. 
I've got exactly what I had over here. So in conventional terms, when you start working with creating Blu-rays and DVDs on other systems, at this point, you've had to spend ages encoding the DVD, only to realize, damn it, my sign language guy should have been at the top right. No. Go back, Premiere, easily fixed. Highlight him, go to effects controls, motion, pick him up, move him. Back in Encore, just changes automatically. Not rendered anything. Until the moment you hit burn disk, you have not created any media. And it will do it all for you dynamically. So the last thing I'm going to show, I mentioned that uh, in terms of our project types, uh, I won't say changes here, I've got Blu-ray and DVD. In terms of my output build, there is actually a third option, Flash. So, and this is what we call this business of a web DVD. So, it's the picture quality of a Blu-ray, it's full, it's an F4V, it's, a, it's an MPEG-4 embedded inside a Flash. And what it gives you, I won't go and do the full encode, but it gives you a directory full of stuff. An index.html, a Swift, a bunch of video sources of all sorts, ready for you to just double click. That doesn't seem to work with Chrome when you open it in IE. There we have it, a full Blu-ray playing back inside a browser. So I can hit play. I've got random access over the video. But all of that text-based metadata that we've been talking about that may have come from a script or I may have embedded later on is now completely searchable. So we search for the word child. It knows at 37 seconds in, he says, when you were a child, you sat as all children sit at the right hand of mercy. Double click, play. complexity and the full uh, scope and uh, uh, possibilities you have with a DVD put inside a website. Thank you very much for listening. That's me about done. Uh, and I'll be around for a minute if anyone has any questions. Thanks very much.